Welcome everyone to another episode of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. As always, we're here to keep you up to date with the latest news, tech, content and wisdom from the world of of marketing. And my co-host, as always, is a man on a mission to demystify digital marketing. He's the host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast. Please welcome Mr. Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you so much. What a pleasure it is to spend more time with the man with the rules on the mission to keep marketing simple, the host of the Roger video series and the voice of the marketing and finance podcast. I give you Mr. Roger Edwards. Oh, thank you so much, Pascal. And here we are with episode 52, and we've got lots of great content to talk about. We've got a great film to talk about, maybe. And we're going to go straight into the first section of the show, which is in the news. And we start with a rather sad news. Inventor Sir Clive Sinclair, who popularised the home computer and invented the pocket calculator, has died at his London home aged 81. Ah, oh, that's such a shame. The John Lewis partnership will hire thousands of extra staff in the run-up to Christmas amid growing anxiety about supply chains and worker shortages. Avon is celebrating his 135th anniversary with a renewed pledge to help women transform their lives for the better, a series of updates to its Avon On digital platform and the introduction of the Avon Reward Scheme. The Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, has fined household names We Buy Any Car £200,000 after they sent out over 191 million emails to customers. Oh, goodness. Well, comparison website Money Supermarket has relaunched its brand in a move to focus on saving customers money. The new brand will include a team of money-saving special agents called the Money Super 7. Weight loss and wellness brand WW, which was formerly known as Weight Watchers, has appointed TMW Unlimited as its creative agency following a three-way pitch. Winnie the Pooh's house is now listed on Airbnb and fan can stay at the Airbnb. Oh yes, the under the acre wood to celebrate the 95th anniversary of the Disney character invented by A.A. A. Milner. And just 38% of consumers are familiar with the metaverse, despite growing tech dependence, a report finds. So, Pascal, let's just take a moment to remember Clive Sinclair. And, and do you know, this was I, I did think this was quite sad. I, I read it in the, on the, uh, in the news uh, websites this morning. And it, and it made me think, I've, I've always thought I'm, I'm classed as Generation X and in general, Generation X, quite technologically um, sort of impotent. And I've often been surprised how I've been a Generation X, but I've sort of grown up quite comfortable with technology. And indeed, I've embraced content and social media and, and digital marketing and all of that stuff. And I think I can trace it back to Clive Sinclair and having a ZX Spectrum. Now, I did miss out on the ZX80 and the ZX81, but the ZX Spectrum was a, a revolution for me in terms of playing games and learning how to program a computer. So Clive really has been pretty instrumental in shaping my entire career. I think his impact was felt across Europe. He was known in um, France, although he was called Saint Clair, and we would pronounce his name. <laughs> And he was anonymous with the computer. I mean, as we shared in This Week in History, I had the Auric Atmos, uh, another UK Ashley um, invention. But the ZX series, my friends had it. And I think it was almost this little kind of click of, you know, the ZX uh, Sinclair users, the Commodore users, and the Auric users. But the good thing was we could all swap games and the cassettes because it was from the same language. But this contribution around, you know, the pocket calculator, am I right in thinking you also invented the first one, of the, the first electronic watches? I think you did as well, yeah. And, of course, the uh, the C5 mm. um, sort of mini car that... Um, always look very dangerous to me. And I know that the C5 was derided a lot by the media, but hey, hang on a minute, look where we are today, Roger. Mm -hmm. There's not, yeah. you know, a car manufacturer not thinking about uh, electric cars and looking at ways in which the batteries can be made efficient. So and I love the way in which, you know, it was referred in this news item as an inventor, an inventor with an entrepreneurial streak. And, mm -hmm. and I think he also has had a contribution to the world of business and by taking risk and trying new things, but also 
a sense, he was also in tune with customer, customer needs and wants, and yeah. did a very good job of that. Yeah, so, I mean, technology and marketing owes a great debt to him because he, he effectively made computers accessible to the masses even before PC prices came down to affordable levels. I'm sure I can remember seeing adverts for the ZX80, and it was only about £80, which yep. I guess 30, 40 years ago was, was quite expensive in real terms. But even so, you know, if you went and bought a, a big desktop computer in those days, like a, a Research Machines 380Z, it would have been about four grand. So four grand plays 80 quid was a massive, massive move to making uh, technology ac uh, accessible to everybody. Here's a thought for you, Roger. We've not spoken about it, but just because this news is so, so recent, shall we dedicate next week's This Week in History to Sir Clive Sinclair and just look at his life? I think that's a good idea. Let's do that. Yeah, there's Super. loads to talk about. Loads to talk about. So I, I also wanted to home in on this news item about Weight Watchers, mm. or as they're now known, WW. And I guess it it made, it made me realise that of a company like WW was originally founded with one specific aim, and that was to help people lose weight, hence Weight Watchers. But over time, they've they've widened out in, into, into other health and well-being areas, and they don't just do diets anymore. And of course, they've you could almost say they were saddled with a brand, which which implies that their niche is a lot narrower than it actually is. So they've obviously had to move away from being called Weight Watchers, and they've rebranded themselves WW. Um, but it does it does sort of make you think that if you are starting a business and you do have a niche, and let's face it, it's one of the marketing gurus' things at the moment, isn't it? You've got to have a niche. You've got to have a narrow niche because that's the way to be successful. If your company name is based upon that narrow niche and then you eventually outgrow it, you might be setting yourself up later for quite a bit of work in rebranding to cope with that. Do you know that's so true as well, particularly when you talk about the internet, where do you remember that there was a phase where people used to buy domain name that were very yeah. localised? It would be like plumbernewcastle.co.uk or digital marketing edinburgh.co.uk. And of course, that rapidly, they would outgrow, you know, the, the, the specific area and got themselves into a, a pickle that they wanted to buy the new domain names that sometimes were not available. So it's, it plays that all the time, that typically when you have a strong offer and a response to, to a need, you will always, always outgrow your niche and then you have to tackle it at some stage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, hats off to them. They've, they've had mm. to do this. And, and I've been quite critical of a few brands recently that have, you know, rebranded and Aberdeen Asset Management changed their name to Aberdeen or something <laughs> like that, which was a to total and uh, an utter waste of time. But, you know, these people have now got their new focus and their, you know, good luck to them with their new agency and, let, and let's see what they, they come up with. And another thing that's been amusing me recently is talk of the metaverse. It just seems to be that uh, the metaverse is the latest big buzzword um, in the marketing community. You know, we've had Bitcoin, we've had NFTs, and goodness me, does Gary V not ever stop going on about NFTs. Um, but the latest thing is this metaverse. Now, effectively, the metaverse is a virtual world. Um, and, you know, you could argue that a game like Fortnite is a metaverse because it, it creates a virtual world, especially if you, if you actually put the goggles on and immerse yourself in it. But if you listened to all of the marketing gurus at the moment, you'd think everybody should be piling in and spending millions and millions and billions on a metaverse, whether you're a travel company, whether you're a games company, whether you are a restaurant, they sh you should have a metaverse. And this report is saying, well, actually, only 38% of consumers are even aware of the term metaverse, let alone what a metaverse actually is. And I just wonder, once again, are we not just witnessing marketers jumping onto the latest shiny toy without actually thinking about what the customer actually wants? And do customers really want 
all this money to be invested in metaverses? Or do they actually just want decent products and decent service? <laughs> uh, do you know, uh, what, what is amusing is just this, you know. So, of course, a few months ago, he was talking about Clubhouse, and then they moved on to something else and something else. And as a profession that you and I absolutely love and want to protect, this is just desperate. Every single time there's a term like this. And it will go away. You know, in the next few months, people will stop talking about it. But it's this need to be seen and heard using the lingo of the time somehow to create some form of credibility and, and gravitas. And I think it's very sad that sometimes it may work. I want to let people know the 62% of people who've never heard of Metaverse to feel quite relaxed about it. A, I think it's an awful term. It's not very easy to understand because if you look at Meta to begin with, it has so many different meanings, whether you look at the English or Greek or Latin origin and then verse universe. And a company like Facebook, has been playing with Metaverse for a very long time with their mm -hmm. VR um, headset. And they've tried to have people, for example, watching football matches and, and the likes using avatars. So you would walk into a room with your kind of 3D uh, avatar, graphical representation, and you would uh, allegedly have a, a social uh, event. And it never worked because people will say, no, it's fine, I watched a football match on my own or I have um, Facebook on and I can just comment using text or, or whatever. I don't feel the need to be virtually present. Uh, there was conferences as well, Roger, who tried that meta gaming, so whereby you would uh, register and then you would have an avatar and you would, like a game, like a RPG game, you would kind of uh, travel around and visit the venue and talk to people and you would talk to their avatars. That didn't work very well at all. People said, I can't just have a Zoom call. I want to speak <laughs> to a real person. Absolutely right. I mean, I've seen exactly that. You know, people sat around a table all wearing headsets, looking at sort of cartoon computer graphic representations of themselves. And this is supposed to be the alternative to the Zoom call. Now, most of us are fed, fed up to the back teeth of Zoom calls. I think the last thing people want is to put a headset on uh, and, and interact with a computerized version of themselves. But I did start this section by saying that I'm a Gen Xer and I've grown up thinking that I appreciate technology. So maybe I'm betraying that uh, confidence uh, with this attitude. But let's wait and see, Pascal, how and whether people are still talking about the metaverse as much in a couple of months' time. So as always, lots of great news stories there, and we could probably have talked uh, quite a long time about all of them. But let's move on now to the content spotlights. In this section of the show, Pascal and I bring to the table a piece of content that has caught our attention this week. Could be a video, could be an article, could be a podcast. So Pascal, tell me what is in your sights this week? So this is an article that I discovered using my favorite app, Flipboard. It's um, from a online learning platform called e EDX or Education X, if you want to use the, the full version. Just a bit of background, this platform was actually launched uh, in 2012 by Professor Argawa with colleagues from MIT and Harvard. We wanted to make uh, education uh, accessible globally, and I think it's just a wonderful, wonderful mission. So um, edX or EDX have got all kind of sectors covered, Roger. They've got all occupations covered, including marketing and recently through Flipboard they discovered this very interesting kind of um, content marketing efforts as in an article that also links to the courses that they have on the platform and the title is as follows navigating marketing careers your guide to jobs skills and breaking in and the article has four key elements for segment the first one marketing careers from general marketing jobs to digital marketing specialties. Then we move on to navigating non-linear marketing and career paths. Then we have marketing skills, developing a T-shaped marketing skill set. And finally, how to start a career in marketing, three tips. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the bottom one, work my way up to the first one. And there's a reason for that, as you'll see. So the three tips to start a career in marketing, which of course, Roger, and I would encourage you to consider. Number one, develop a strong marketing foundation. And what they are arguing, rightly so, the team at EDX, is that you don't have to necessarily follow the traditional academic route. 
you can use their platforms, you can do internships, you can read books, you can go online. My goodness, you can really educate yourself. But they say, in addition to basic marketing knowledge, you've got to also have the right attitude. And what they're saying is that the marketing as a function, as a role, requires so much in terms of interpersonal skills, in terms of flexibility, adaptability, that you've got to have the right attitude and nurture that. So number two, in addition to the strong marketing foundation, develop an expertise in a particular area so you can really stand out from the crowd. And number three, interestingly, I've been saying this quite a while now with university students, create a portfolio to impress at the interview. So essentially, don't just rock up and say, I've studied hard, but I've done nothing. They say, no, please start your own side project, start your own blog, start your podcast, do something on LinkedIn that would be of interest. So that's the tip about how to start. Number three, in the order which I'm reading it, marketing skills, developing a T-shaped marketing skill set, which is another one. I've seen it said often, but what they're saying is that you need to have the fundamentals of marketing as your horizontals. So everything that you need to understand, positioning, branding, strategy, and the four Ps, Roger, place, Yay. price, product, and promotion, <laughs> according to Jeffrey Frowine, who is one of the instructor for marketing foundations. So Jeffrey, well done. It's very important. And then once you've had this kind of um, um, horizontal skills, which include, by the way, data measurement, storytelling skills, strategic skills, user experience, then you can choose to specialize in the vertical, which could be social media, it could be AR, it could be anything you want. So I was really reassured to read that from, from Jeffrey as well. If we move on to one up, navigating a non, non-linear marketing career path. So this is this um, idea of because your skills are very transformation, uh, sorry, very transferable, Roger, and because you will be able to navigate across different sectors and different roles, don't be surprised if you don't have a linear career path and embrace that. And indeed, Lauren John- Johnson, Johnston Smith, sorry, who is also working on EDX from the University of Edinburgh, talks about this idea of you know marketing offers a versatile and diverse career path where you can choose based on your personal preferences and interest and she adds marketing is a very rewarding career yes lauren it is indeed let me move up then to the final one marketing careers from general marketing job to digital marketing specialties and this is where i might disagree but only because of my love and and passion for marketing so they they're trying and i think it's difficult to split the uh, the careers for the reader that could be a young person or someone that wants to obviously change their, their career completely into groups and i think that's always tricky so they say group one could be digital marketing group two could be general marketing group three could be brand marketing and group four could be public relations and i must confess i had to read that several times roger because I just couldn't agree with it. You know, my mind was kind of going through, well, that's not my understanding. That's not my career. And I can see why you try and do that. But I think it could be slightly misleading or, you know, slightly under communicating what it goes on. And then I must confess, I just didn't know what they meant by general marketing. So I read the article and they say that general marketing is about creating strategy to drive customer demand for a company product and services. And the general marketing is about measuring marketing campaigns, track budget spend, conduct market research, and analyze consumer behavior. And whilst I agree with all those activities, in my head, and as someone, of course, has been working in marketing now since the early 90s, that's not general marketing. That's any form of marketing. <laughs> yes. So I have some sympathy with the challenge of trying to describe careers in marketing in the context of a job search. And I wonder whether for this particular segment, it was more trying to align the language and the description to the the way in which you would find jobs on, on those um, job boards or the way in which employers may think. But um, I don't know. I think that the last one, not wishing to suggest that the article is not worth reading, is tricky for me because that is not how I perceive marketing as a career that's not how i would split it but everything else they've said i think was just amazing yeah i mean on the one hand pascal it's great that they've acknowledged that marketing isn't just advertising and it isn't Mm. just promotion i mean i i see this on linkedin every day almost where people talk about marketing when they really mean advertising and and i often have to 
bite my lip or force myself not to comment on these articles and try to put people right. Um, But it's good that they're talking about the four P's, price, product, place, and promotion, as you said. But I agree with you, this, this idea of there being a general marketing and digital marketing. I, I just think we should move away from that. All of the things that you said were important in the general marketing bucket, like positioning and, and identifying customers and measurement. That's it. That's what you have to do with digital marketing as well, you know. And and pretty much everything these days is online to a certain extent. So let's just start calling it marketing again, but marketing in the broadest sense starting with a customer, developing a product, and then promoting that product rather than just talking about advertising. And again, you know, we, we do not wish to take away the amazing work from the team at EDX. But for me, it was more this kind of, oh, hang on, I, I don't think like that. And, and there's, many, there's different ways in which you can explain marketing. And I wonder whether, for me, you think thinking more of um, potentially B2B, B2C, or whichever term, then you can look at, I would argue, I would agree that public relations is its own unique um, kind of uh, discipline, and one that people actually uh, should do more or know more about. But um, apart from that, really, for one segment of a, a long article, or well, the other three, every time I was uploading, you know, the, the statements from people clearly, like you and I, want to make sure marketing is done right. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Pascal, shall I tell you about my content spotlight? Please, yes. Well, I have a confession to make. I've chosen another article by Mark Ritson from Marketing Week, and I do try very hard not to choose his articles because I've chosen them quite often. But this one stood out for me for all sorts of different reasons. It, it sort of goes to something that we've just been saying about marketing always been seen to be about advertising and nothing else when of course it is so much more than that but this article just picks up on so many very important business concepts that again I think we've sort of lost sight of a little bit in our absolute desire to talk about digital marketing constantly so the article is entitled Tom Kerridge's prices aren't a rip-off if they're what the market will pay. Now, for anybody who's listening or watching this who doesn't know who Tom Kerridge is, Tom Kerridge is a quite famous chef. He actually holds two Michelin stars, and he's, his restaurant is a very super-duper sort of gastropub-style restaurant. He serves what I was, I suppose would describe as posh versions of pub grub, you know, steak and chips, for example. But his steak and chips, Pascal, cost 87 quid. Okay. So it's really, really high-end pricing. Now, the reason why uh, Ritson's written this article is because a food and wine critic by the name of Guy Woodward has actually taken offence to the prices being charged by Tom Kerridge. And he's been all over Twitter saying this is just a rip-off, total rip-off, huge prices, you know, for goodness sake, it's not accessible, um, it's elitism, it's all sorts of uh, derogatory ways to describe Tom Kerridge. Now, Tom Kerridge has come back and sort of said, well, you know, this is my market, I target a certain clientele, and that clientele is prepared to pay that price which is absolutely fine and and this is what this is what the article focuses on and what Mark Richardson is saying is have we forgotten about the importance of price in the marketing mix you you said it before price product place promotion it's one of the four p's of marketing and once again and I'm going to actually read this paragraph <clears throat> because it does sort of uh refer back to one of our news items so mark says the saga illuminates an issue in marketing that we talk about too infrequently within the discipline our conferences are overcrowded with tossers predicting the imminent domination of the metaverse and digital maestros detailing the disruption of everything because of Bitcoin and 4D printing. But very few marketers ever discuss issues that are approximately nine bazillion times more important for brands, namely price setting, the price itself, and then its communication. And and, and then once again, just what we've been saying is absolutely right. We very rarely talk about price. I can't remember... The last time I went to a conference, Pascal, where there was a session on pricing, 
I can't remember the last time I went to a conference where there was a session on profit. And profit is one of the things that Mark uses this example to focus in on. Because again, um, you see this every day on Clubhouse, on LinkedIn, people talking about, I've built a seven-figure business or an eight-figure business. It's always about the revenue. Yes, you may have built a seven-figure business, and you describe that seven-figure business in terms of revenue, but if the costs are greater than that, or you're spending a few pounds less than the seven figures to actually bring the seven figures in, you're not making profit, and that isn't sustainable long-term. And what he's saying here is, that carriage, you might think he's very expensive. You might think that he isn't accessible to the masses, but that's exactly what he's done. He's done classic marketing. He's identified a target market of people who are prepared to pay a premium for his style of food. And if you think it's expensive, or if you think it doesn't represent good value, or you know, you like like the uh, like the critic. You think it's a rip off, then you're not his target market, and that's fine. It's what marketing's all about. But what Kerridge is doing is he's making a profit for his business, and he's continued to make a profit for his business during the lockdown and as we start to come out of the pandemic. And Ritson goes into a lot more about revenue and why revenue and profit are things that we should talk about a lot more but he you know the 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 actual summary right at the end of his article says that you might think that the steak at 87 quid is ridiculously expensive and if you do that's fine you're not the target market as i've said and maybe you should go to a, a cheaper restaurant a weatherspoons or something like that it's probably more likely to be my my, my cup of tea there pascal but his ending advice to carriage is If people are having this sort of conversation about your food, perhaps the time is now right to increase your prices even more. (laughs) Very, very good. I know it's very hard to not choose Mark Ritson's amazing work as part of of this podcast, and I'm sure the audience will, will forgive yet again, because... It's really stimulating the conversation. But what I like about Mark's work is is also to me always on the money, literally, it's, forgive the expression, when it comes to the mood. And I'm sensing two things. The quiet majority of honest and ethical marketers are no longer uh, wishing to be quiet because there is just too much misinformation. There's too much of that nonsense all over the, the internet around seven figures. I mean, even I even saw an advert. I wish I could find this. I, I want to actually critique it of this guy saying, let me show you how I help a business make a nine-figure turnover by repurposing videos. That was that was the advert. And I thought, I, I had to think carefully what nine figures is. And therefore, we're talking about billions. I'm not, am I right mm, in this? Mm, Making mm. billions by repurposing videos. What a couple of nonsense. And my position is clearer now. There is an army of compulsive liars all over the internet. And we, you and I, Mark, and many others, we've got to be the antidote here because it's um, a, a worry for the younger generation of marketers coming through the ranks, as we discussed a moment ago. It's also a worry for, for customers, but also those who are going to buy the services of consultants who might actually believe that the metaverse is indeed you know, a very the fine thing to do or might believe that this obsession with hacks and, and tips and tricks as opposed to the four Ps is the way to go. Absolutely. So don't forget about the others, the other four Ps, price. Let's talk about them. And we do talk about them on this podcast, but let's start talking about them at conferences. Let's start writing more articles about them like this one from Mark Ritz. And let's start talking about marketing in general, the whole thing rather than just the promotion. Rant over, Pascal. (laughs) I think it's time. I think it's time to slow things down and it is now time to slide into the technology. So we're going to talk about some marketing tech and apps. In this part of the show, Pascal and I bring to the table marketing tech that has caught our eye over the last week or so. So, Pascal, what wonders are you bringing for me today? 
So these are very simple applications, online applications that are going to help maybe personalize your next presentation that you can do online or in person if you're that lucky. And they all came out when I was invited to speak to local universities, to graduates who are about to enter the world of work in June of next year. And we spoke actually hardly of the many things that you and I covered so far about the portfolio, about the skill set, about the understanding, about being curious, launching an investigation uh, or launching a blog, tidying up your LinkedIn profile, shutting down your Facebook page, for goodness sake, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And because I was with um, an audience and I had a, a clear brief, I was able to just be a bit more creative and lean into our p- common passion of filmmaking more than I would normally so to begin with, I was able to create some slides that had a clear, clear hint of, uh, in terms of typography and look and feel from films, from the Marvel Universe all the way to um, black and white classics. And I discovered in a process a website called fontmimi.com. And what this website allows you to do is to discover the typography and calligraphy of um, popular culture from film to music and more. And I was able to therefore create some what I call title slides, Roger, and more Mm -hmm. using the calligraphy of those classical movies that are important to me from the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark all the way to Jaws and the Marvel Universe and including uh, others. So font Mimi, um, a two things, you can, it allows you to discover what the font is being used. So potentially you can purchase it, but also for the kind of uh, public domain fonts, it has a um, online creator device where you can create your own uh, title. So that's lovely. The second thing is I wanted to, yeah, be a bit different with my photography and my video. And I wanted to just have a different source of copyright free videos and photos than maybe Unsplash and Pexels and many others. I've got nothing against it, but I wanted a fresher look for the presentation. And I discovered that Adobe have a free website that allows you access to free videos and photos. So the URL is in the show notes, but stock.adobe.com and then forward slash UK forward slash free. So I'm assuming they can track your geolocation. And I will say the photography and the video files are very different. You, you know, Literally, they found very fresh to me compared to all the other popular platforms. So there you have it, just something to personalize and lean into your passion for your next presentation. Great, great suggestions there, Pascal. I'm definitely going to have a look at the Adobe stock thing because like you, I've, I've used Pixels and Pixabay quite a lot. And yeah, sometimes you think, oh, I've seen that before. And you've worse, you see other people use oh, it yeah. as well. So you want to try and find something a little bit fresh. So this week I was um, I was doing some housekeeping on my website. Um, I do this quite regularly, maybe every quarter, just go through, make sure that the links are all right maybe maybe uh, refresh some older blogs and, and older podcast pages. And I found myself, uh, oh, look, there's been another update to WordPress, which is what I use for my, uh, for my website. And, and it really occurred to me that actually, you know, I've been using WordPress now for about seven years. And so I've grown with, with all the different iterations and, of, of WordPress and all the amazing stuff that they've, they've added on to it. And it occurred to me that even though it's quite intuitive and relatively easy to use, I think that, again, now maybe the learning curve for WordPress is quite a lot higher than it used to be. So somebody wanting to start a blog, whereas 10 years ago WordPress was the obvious choice, I think maybe now it might be a little bit complicated. So it just occurred to me to take a look at what else was out there um, for somebody who's wanting to start a blog site for their business and want something really quick and out of the box. And the two that I focused in on uh, are Wix and Blogger. Now, funnily enough, Wix is one of those websites that seems to advertise incessantly on YouTube. It's always one of those that comes up in the five seconds before you can skip the ad at the beginning of a YouTube video. But the reality is you can be up and running on Wix within minutes literally within minutes, and it's so intuitive and really easy for people, even, you know, people with very little website or technology um, experience. So I was actually quite surprised by how much flexibility and functionality there is. Similar to WordPress, I guess, but it seems to be presented in a in a much more um, 
straightforward way and I think it's really quite attractive and the second one blogger um, is within the the Google suite of products so it, it can um, it can synchronize with things like Google Docs and things like that and obviously uh, the the uh, Google Anal- Analytics uh, becomes very easy in there as well and similarly it beautifully simple and as you know, Pascal, I love things that are beautifully simple. So if you're thinking about starting a blog from scratch and you don't want to mess around with too much complexity to get you started, I would seriously recommend having a look at Wix or having a look at Blogger. Yeah, thanks for a reminder. You know, Blogger, a fun fact for you, was my first platform for my failed attempt at launching a blog in, in the 90s because it's been around that long. Actually, do you know, I've not looked at it for so long. I'm curious to see how it's evolved. But yeah, back in the 90s, I launched a blog. Well, I I failed to launch a blog about uh, antipasto. So here's the thing. (laughs) I love Italian food. I love all all food, but Italian food in particular. And I love the starter called antipasto, which is this Mm -hmm. kind of mix of uh, cooked meat and vegetables and, and all sort of things. And usually when I go in a restaurant, it's normally for two. And they're always yeah. surprised that I can clean the play, but I'm just, I just love it. So I started this um, website where my idea was I would go around the restaurants of the northeast of England and, and eat lots of food and comment about it. And what I didn't realize is that there wasn't that many Italian restaurants in the 90s in the northeast of England. So I think I may, maybe I wrote three articles and that was the end of my blogging for that particular niche area. Maybe I should start it again. Yeah, again, memory lane, Pascal, memory lane. And talking about memory lane, it's time to fire up the flux capacitor, set the controls for the TARDIS, and wind up our time circuits. We are going to head back in time to this week in history. And in 1946, the first annual Cannes Film Festival opens in the south of France, welcoming an international audience who could enjoy the work of 21 participating nations peacefully one year after the end of World War II. In 1960, the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, was launched in Newport, Virginia. It was the most astonishing vessel of its time and by far the largest warship in the world and powered by eight nuclear reactors. Wow, well in 1979, CompuServe becomes the first online service offering dial-up connection to access online chat systems, message forums, extensive software library, and a series of popular online games. And in 1994, The Shawshank Redemption, directed by Frank Darabont and starring Tin Robbins and Morgan Freeman, was released. Ah, that long ago. Wow. I know, I know, 1994. What a great film. And we should probably feature that in the film marketing section because it is a great film, but from a Stephen King book. And I think the, the Stephen King book was called Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, uh, which was probably a bit too long for a, for a mm. film, film title. But what I wanted to talk about today, Pascal, was that first aircraft carrier the USS Enterprise now of course I've chosen that because of the obvious link between the USS Enterprise the real aircraft carrier and of course coming about six years later the USS Enterprise the starship USS Enterprise that we saw in Star Trek and we've known and loved in the Star Trek universe ever since but I think you have to remind yourself that the USS Enterprise was originally a real warship as opposed to a science fiction invention. Do you know what, what's interesting as well is that it was in 19, 1960. If you said to me, you know, what was the first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier built? I thought it would be much later because mm-hmm. in my head, it's a very, very complex technology. Yeah, yeah. I, absolutely, and and yeah, you think, oh wow, nine, 1960, That's yeah, that's quite that's quite early on. Um, but I think it's really interesting that it was powered by eight nuclear reactors. I mean, we're talking severe technology here, and and a, and a ship which carries so many aircraft and so many men uh, and personnel to be actually quite. You know, it must have been quite a scary thing to be involved with because it was new technology. You know, most people would have associated nuclear with 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki less than a decade, uh, slightly more than a decade earlier. And so the connotation of I'm getting on this ship with all these other people and all these weapons of war, and it's basically powered by a nuke. Mm. Yeah, and no, I think I think you're right. Back to, to the language as well. Well, talking of things that have happened earlier than people seem to always think or remember, CompuServe 1979. Ooh. And the reason why I chose this uh, item for this week in history is back to, I hope that uh, viewers and listeners will forgive us, this idea of this impression that everything happened with Facebook or with uh, you know Twitter. And we, you and I, and our parents and grandparents could access the internet really a few years later in the, in the mid-80s using dial-up with that you know, very charming kind of interesting noise you used to get. But you know, when social media marketing and, and the social networks are being praised for inventing a number of things that bring the world together, I was already on message forums, definitely in the 80s, you, you know, were on chats. We accessed um, games. We uh, could book cinema tickets online and so on using all, all, all those systems. And we are where we are thanks to, you know, a CompuServe who is no longer with us because I think through history um, they've been bought and bought again and they kind of they disappeared. And I think it's, um, you know, a company called Viacom who owns them now. I could, I could be wrong. But I think for me it's this idea of there is legacy and as part of one's understanding of today and you know next year and the year after, if um, you like to use you know that as an analogy, knowing where it all came from, just as as a as a clear idea, it should be reassuring that there's a logical progression. So, with respect, you know, the metaverse, where did it begin? Well, I think it began obviously with CompuServe, where people could chat to each other and they want to do it that way. Where did Bitcoin, you know, uh, begin? Where well, it began with bartering on those chat systems. You know, you do this for me and I do that for you. So I think for me is what I dislike about the way in which tech and digital marketing is presented. It's almost, look at this amazing thing that just happened a moment ago, as opposed to look at the wonderful evolution of, you know, I don't know, the popular online games, which is why now you can play you know, Star Trek with your friends, you know, all over the internet. Yeah, I, I remember, again, I'm trying to think back, those those sort of message boards and chat systems, they were part of the same browser as Outlook. And it was, was it alt binaries, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's right, Ge yes, yeah. Geo yeah. Is it GeoCities? Mm. Um, and, you, yeah, I mean, in those days, you, you, you know, if you wanted to have a chat about Star Wars, you'd have to go and look for alt binary Star Wars and, and things like that as opposed to an actual message forum. But, yeah, as we always say, Pascal, this week in history is obviously a trip down memory lane, but always to remember that everything that we rely upon today, the technology that powers our businesses, powers our lives – has evolved from something like this that happened in the past. And I really do feel that we should continue to honour that past because it's what allows us to live in the present. Shall we move on to our creator shout out section? In this section of the show, Pascal and I give a shout out to creators, usually from within our network, sometimes from outside of our network, but they all have one thing in common. They are great content creators. So, Pascal, who have you got this week? Oh, I've got a wonderful surprise for you this week, Roger. People that I discovered very recently by doing some research about films, because that's usually what I spend my time <laughs> doing. And they are outside of my network, I would say, of course, and they are not on the business world, but I think they are an amazing source of inspiration about how they've gone ahead with their podcast and video series. So I would like to give Bill Sebold and Casey Shearer a shout out for their series Deluxe Edition, yet another pop culture podcast. And the reason why I've chosen them is because what they've done is so incredibly ambitious and so well executed that it would be generally a source of inspiration for many people out there. So as an may indicate, they are looking at pop culture, primarily movies from the 80s. And you could say, great, so what you're saying, Pascal, is that they are having a chat, you know, Bill and Casey having a chat about how the 80s was so much better than it is now when it comes to the enjoyment of watching movies, renting the VHS cassette and having a chat with your pals. Well, they've gone beyond that. Can you believe, Roger, that 
all the episode, they have a special guest, and not just you know the, the unknowns from the filmmaking industry. They have some real names. So, for example, I was doing some research on the, the Beastmaster. Do you remember the Beastmaster with Mark, yes. Mark Singer? Well, yes, they had Mark Singer as a guest on their podcast. They had Tom Skerritt on their podcast <laughs> from Top Gun and more. They even had Tammy Stronach, the princess from The Neverending Story, and so it goes on. So not only I love the ambition about you know tracking those individuals and finding ways to have them on the show, I love the way they've gone ahead with the website, I love they've gone ahead with uh, you know, trying to um, monetize their efforts and build a community and so on and so forth. And you and I know for Bill and Casey, the amount of work that would go behind the scenes would be quite significant to pull this off. And I'm just going to say thank you, Bill and Casey, because you're making my weekend so much more enjoyable. But also thank you for being such an inspiration to all of us. Well, you know my opinions on pop culture, Pascal. I think it's one of the best things you can do to weave pop culture into your marketing because it's so current and it appeals to so many people. Now, my shout out this week is for a lady called Debbie Ekins. Uh, Met Debbie a few years back uh, when the Content Marketing um, Academy was still going. And at the time, Debbie was doing a lot of content for a jacuzzi company that she used to work for. And I always thought it was quite interesting because she used to put out one or two videos a week just answering questions that people have about jacuzzis and, and spa pools and that sort of thing and and she was one of the archetypal content marketers just asking answering questions that customers have this latest um uh, sort of entrepreneurial venture that debbie's undertaking is called the cool story company and what they've done is they've come up with these very I think, very beautiful, stylized uh, wine flasks. Now, if you're going out for a picnic um, into the countryside, wherever it is, and you want to take with you a nice, cool bottle of white wine, um, you might have to find a freezer bag to put your white wine in bottle in so that it's still nice and cold when you get to your destination. So, But these flasks allow you to effectively decant the wine into the flask and they're very pretty uh, with metal tops and you can buy them in a range of colors and it keeps the wine cool and it, hence the cool story and i just think it's a great idea and um, it's a physical product as opposed to a digital product and i and i, I sometimes do like to see how people promote these um, physical products but it's been very successful their initial launch i think they cleared their stock within days and now they're back with another um uh, load of uh, of stock and they're doing a load of promotions they're now uh, allowing corporates to buy them in bulk for shows and that and, and exhibitions and expos and that sort of thing and i just think it's fantastic so debbie well done and uh must get an order in i quite like the sort of turquoise color one excellent and you know what's lovely about this one is back to this idea of spotting actually you could argue a minor problem but to execute with uh, flair and style, which is the case for both our content creators this week. Fantastic, Pascal. It's time. Always one of the most interesting parts of the show, and I suspect that this week it's going to be quite a debate. Shall we head into film marketing? Welcome to the film marketing section of the show. And this week, we're going to talk about one of the most popular films from the 1980s. I mean, this film has ridiculously high ratings on all of the movie review sites. It's The Princess Bride, and let's have a look at the trailer. Grandfather's here. Can't you tell me I'm sick? I'll pinch my cheek. I hate that. Maybe he won't. Hey. Out of the city. Huh? I brought you a special present. What is it? It was the book my father used to read to me when I was sick, and I used to read it to your father. And today, I'm going to read it to you. It was a time when life didn't seem so complicated. Marriage is what brings us together today. What? 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 I'm killing myself once we reach the honeymoon suite. Wouldn't that be nice, hmm? A courtly age. 
of gentle conversation. I won't always come for you. But how can you be sure? This is true love. Oh, no. Is this a kissing book? No. Actually, there was a lot of treachery. Peril. <laughs> and revenge. Prepare to die. Never go in against the Sicilian when death is on the line! <laughs> There were affairs of state. But I've got my country's 500th anniversary to plan, my wedding to arrange, my wife to murder, and Gilda to frame for it. I'm swamped. And affairs of the heart. My Wesley will always come for me. Your Wesley is dead. I've seen worse. Bye bye, boy. Have fun storming the castle. It's more than dirty. What's the difference? We've got him. Think it'll work? Take a miracle. Goodbye. It's a story of love. A tale of adventure. It's as real as the feelings you feel. The kissing again. Someday you may not mind so much. The Princess Bride. Not just your basic, average, everyday, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, ho-hum fairy tale. So Pascal, not the most engaging of trailers, I would I would say. It, it's just incredible. I mean, this is you know the movie that almost defines the eighties. I mean, many many will, but this is the ultimate kind of family movie, uh, wonderful action comedy with um, music by Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits um, fame, directed by Rob Reiner, Spinal Tap, Stand by Me, which should also make film marketing one day, and and Misery, and. For the fans of the movie globally, if this is the first time you've watched and heard the trailer, you'll be just as confused as the poor people in 1987 in the US and 88, sorry, and uh, in the UK. Yeah, now, Pascal, last night, believe it or not, was the first time that I've ever seen this film. I'm one of those people who, has, for whatever reason, <laughs> has never watched the Princess Bride. Now, I went into it with those scores in my head, you know, 98% on Rotten Tomatoes, you know, 10 out of 10 on the Internet Movie Database. And obviously, I know this film is loved by billions of people across the planet, but I didn't get it. I really oh, no. didn't get it. I thought it was awful um i thought i thought i thought it it looked cheap i thought the script was rotten i didn't think it was funny uh, i thought the acting was pretty wooden um the special effects were if 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 any were there were woeful and it just looked like a few people decided to dress up in period costume and wander around a few um sets and and and, and try and do something uh I just I, I I I was sitting there thinking, what am I missing? Why why don't I get this? <laughs> right. It, it, why well, why am I not in on the joke? Is uh, were they? Uh, I don't know. Help me, help me. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I think um, viewers and listeners from other world would be thinking maybe didn't watch the right film because <laughs> it would be just not. Uh, you know, beyond our comprehension, how I, 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 I would generally can feel, oh no, he didn't get it, he didn't get, and like me, I mean, if I watched The Princess Bride, I can recite all the lines now, uh, I laugh at all the jokes and so on, and it, it reminds me a bit of um, back in the days when I watched The Big Lebowski with my wife Denise, so I watched The Big, the Big Lebowski. And I'm laughing, I'm crying, and I'm rolling on the carpet. And then when it's over, I'm wiping my eyes, and all the tears from my eyes, and I'm trying to catch my breath. And I look across the room, and there's Denise there sat there thinking, there's nothing funny about this film. And I think it's almost like you've got to play along as uh, like you would with a pantomime or like you would with with a show. And I can assure you, Roger, the script is spot on. Rob Reiner would not, uh, with his colleague, you know, do a, a job. And the way in which they secured locations all over the UK, you even have a Princess Bride tour, which I will not subject you to based on <laughs> your, your feedback a moment ago. But um, the storytelling of, you know, the granddad and the grandson, Fred Savage and Peter Falk, 
and how the story is read out is actually respecting the structure of the book from 1973 by William Goldman. And the the actors really t- uh, took their time and get in, got into the characters. And whilst obviously this was deemed to be a box office failure, perhaps a bit harsh, is because once again, the marketing team from the distributors just didn't get the film either. And I think it's because back to what we you and I keep go, uh, talking about, they had to get involved from the beginning. You can't just give somebody the finished product and say, well, you work it out how to market it. I think that was an error. But the film, why is it so popular and why is it working so well is because of the rental market. And what we're going to do with, with the marketing bit, because I'm not going to try and convince you that this is an amazing <laughs> film at all. We will respect, obviously, you know, your, your own opinion. But I think what has been fascinating is that next year will be the 35th anniversary of The Princess Bride. I might take you to maybe an uh, anniversary screening, Roger, and maybe <laughs> if you watch it together and you see me laughing at everything, it might it might convince you. But what we've done with Roger, we've done the research, and we want to kind of take it step by step almost from um, give or take 15, 20 years later, and how have they kept The Princess Bride alive using obviously the support from the fans as well as um, support from, from the actors. They have, Roger, and I'm so pleased, an official website. You know my complaints about movies, <laughs> and they don't yeah. have a website to speak of. Well, the website has been going on, princessbrideforever.com, and a very, very active social media account, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And just from the uh, lessons and inspirations point of view, what they've done with social media is great. You know, So they have, like, have you taken the Princess Bride quiz on our official website? They invite people to send their fan art, all the different characters and scenes. They have the Princess Princess Bride fun fact of the week. They all they do birthday celebrations for the author, for the actors, and so on. They um, also link with uh, hashtags. So do you remember, although, although you only watched a film once, unlike people around the world who watch it about a hundred <laughs> times. But do you remember the complaint by Fred Savage that is this a kissing book? And he complains, yes. and eventually doesn't mind so much. So they will link things like you know National Book Day and st- things like this. And they also ask people to vote on their favorite characters. And so it goes on. And I think that's really, really commendable that a movie from 1987, they're finding ways to engage the audience and create a destination with the official website. I have to say, the only part of the film that I did feel <laughs> was quite engaging was the, the interaction between Peter Falk and the little boy. Uh, I think perhaps because it was Columbo, obviously, um, and my memories of Lieutenant Columbo, it was nice to see P- Peter Falk again, but also to see him in a different role. So that did work for me. It was just the rest of it was such a pile of crap. Um, uh, I, I, uh, can't, I, I can't <laughs> let you say that. You know, I'm happy for you to have a different opinion, but you can't say it's a pile of crap. You must okay. agree that the, the sword fight was one of the best you've seen on, 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 on in movies. The sword, sword fight, fight was was interesting, yeah, and and I I did like the way in the sword fight the way that they they the music was totally timed with the strikes. So every mm. time he swung the sword, there was a beat of the music. I thought that was quite clever. Yeah, very, very good. And um, so, wanted to start us off, Roger, with um, October two thousand and eleven. What what happened there? Well, the 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 full cast got back together on Good Morning America. Um, and I, I guess it's like any, it's like a, it could be a Doctor Who, could be Flash Gordon, could be Star Wars. When you get a, an entire cast of a film back together, it always creates a big buzz, doesn't it? It does, yes. And I think they may have, therefore, been priming the, the audience for an anniversary release on DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, a couple of months later, um, director Jason Reitman, who I do believe is a friend of Rob Reiner, actually staged a um, live reading of the Princess Bride script at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for charity. And then we had the Blu-ray, which came out in October 2012. Um Again, you know, 25 years, they're doing a, another cast reunion. There, there seems to be a lot of uh, camaraderie amongst this cast. They do seem to be quite willing to keep coming back, to keep promoting it. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why it has, it has created such a, a legacy and it is such a popular movie because the yeah. cast have continued yeah. to associate themselves with it all this time. 
You're absolutely right. And um, we do know from um, you know the making of The Princess Bride that Rob Reiner played a role as a leader to really make people feel included. You must remember mm-hmm. for s- not all the cast, but some of the cast, you know, they spend many weeks and months away from home. They, they were operating, uh, filming uh, in the UK, which I think is a wonderful coup for the uh, UK film industry. Um, and he kind of m- made a big effort on that. There was also at the time, because Blu-ray was new-ish, I would say, for the consumer market, there was lots of competitions to win free copies. But then we're going to fast forward to April 2016, which is where it gets very interesting about you know content marketing and repurposing and things that you mm-hmm. and I speak about on this show, where the actor Carrie Hughes, who plays Wesley, writes a book, As You Wish, Inconceivable Tales from the Making of the Princess <laughs> Bride. Now, come on, you must tell me that when they were doing the Battle of Wits and when the actor, you know, um, was saying inconceivable all the time, that was very funny, surely, Roger. <laughs> Mm. Was that the bit where they were where he was swapping the gla- the the cup yes. over and one of the cups had well both cups had poison in it I guess but uh, yeah that's right and and then of course in in 2017 there was a 30th anniversary cast members reunited uh, with more TV radio magazine special anniversary screenings around I mean for obviously Pascal um, for somebody who didn't enjoy this film I do appreciate the massive amount of affection that people hold it and again the the way that the the cast and the way that the fans keep that momentum going is absolutely remarkable and I, I imagine that this momentum will continue beyond the 35th and into the 40th anniversary going forward yeah because you can imagine, you know, uh, parents will, will certainly watch it with their children and, and so on and so forth. And what I loved about the um, you know, 2017, uh, there was literally cinemas uh, would take the initiative and organise their own special screening. But one cinema was very lucky because they had this surprise appearance from the actor Carrie Hughes, who, who carries on you know, to really push the, the brand. So that's October 2017, yeah. Yeah, and of course, bringing it right up to date now, we we are on Disney Plus, um, and it's available to a whole new audience on D- Disney Plus. But there's still all sorts of stuff going around. There's the Princess Bride Adventure Game Book, viral campaign inviting people to organize watch parties for the Disney Plus launch. So yeah, it, actually, now thinking about it, it reminds. Do you know what it reminds me a little bit about? Maybe the Rocky Horror Show. Yeah. The Rocky Horror Picture Show. I have to say, that's another film that I'm not a massive fan of, but it obviously has a massive, 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 massive following for similar reasons. You know, it's a comedy. Okay, the the, the Rocky Horror Show is a musical as well. Bit bit offbeat humour, but it's. I think a lot of it is down to the continued involvement of the cast and the continued momentum and fanaticism of the fans. Absolutely. And what is interesting, so you had the announcement by the, the two lead actors, you know, Carrie Hughes and Robin Wright. It was a video message that went viral announcing Disney Plus, you know, uh, April 2020. And of course, then we are at the start of the pandemic. And yeah. it gets tricky. You can't go to the movies. And soon after, in June 2020, um, we have, again, Jason Reitman, who does a fan-made re- re-enactment of The Princess by using famous actors from Jack Black and more um, to raise money for charity to support people who are being impacted upon by, by the pandemic. So it's got that element as well of bringing communities together, which I thought was, uh, was fantastic. And then, you know, we move on, carry on with the diary. September 2020, we've got a, um, you know, on Facebook Live, a um, kind of reading of, you know, the um, the script with some special guests and so on. And as you mentioned, to keep, once again, I think that was the motivation, families entertained and occupied, they released the Princess Bride adventure book game so that um, where we are stuck indoors during lockdown, you can play the game and read the game and probably watch the film again. And there's been a concert as well. Yeah, just recently. Well, actually, actually, no, it's coming up on the twenty eighth of September, um, twenty twenty one, at the Princess Bride in concert at the Hollywood Bowl of all places. Yeah. So, what people will be able to do is um, 
watch you know the the concert played by obviously an orchestra watch the film and cheer laugh and obviously say the lines as you would at the rocky or a picture show or you know any kind of operatic type movies like flash gordon um, and more so so for me what, what has been interesting by the princess pride is if it wasn't for the rental market this movie would have been and gone and disappeared from the face of the earth, because sadly, the, the the official marketing campaign just didn't capture people. It was a confused and confusing message. But luckily, you now they had a different distribution channel, which was the VHS cassette. And then you could argue that it's been the aftermath and and the last thirty years of effort to keep um, to keep it going, which I think is just fascinating. We, we're just very lucky that we, ab- we are able to research all this stuff because of the um, or because of the internet. So really, it is a film that has been kept alive by the fans for mm. the fans. I guess that's the the bottom line with a cast that have continued to play their parts. I suppose over thirty five mm. years. It's absolutely um, incredible, and there's, there's not many movies that, that that would do that to the degree of um, you know the, the Princess Bride, which I, I think it's just uh, signifies to me that's that was the eighties. That was when your friends told you you've got to watch this, even though you've never heard of it. And once again, the trailer is confusing. The poster was almost like um, you could dismiss it as this is a this is a kissing movie because you just didn't get it. And, and I love the fact that that's been rescued by the fans. But I'm going to close this film marketing with um, this very famous quote, Roger. My name is Inigo Montoya. You do not like the Princess Bride. Prepare to die. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's fair to say, Pascal, that in 53 episodes of Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast, this is probably the first film where we haven't been united in our enthusiasm for the film. And, and in, that's fine. That's absolutely, absolutely. fine. Um, you know, we, do, we, we normally like the same sort of things, but Obviously, on occasion, there will be times when our opinions are a little bit further apart. And unfortunately, I, I don't know what it is. It just This just did not grab my attention. But whether I liked it or not, everybody watching or listening to the show, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Is The Princess Bride a 98 out of 100 like its uh, its, its uh, score on Rotten Tomatoes, ten out of ten on Internet Movie Database, or are there a few, very few people out there who agree with me that actually this isn't one of the best films ever made? We'd really love to hear your views, so please leave a comment on the YouTube um, or hit us up on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening and watching Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. We are always so excited and we really enjoy bringing the marketing tech and the films to your attention. Until the next time, go out there and make sure that your marketing is done right. He was Pascal Fantoni and I was Roger Edwards. 